Hey everybody, Sustainable Stace here. It's the end of 2020. I wanna share with you lessons learned in 2020. Wow, what a year. There's been ups, there's been downs, and there's been lots to learn. And that's what I wanna cover with you today in this recap of the year. Lessons learned in 2020, what I'm gonna do different, what I'm gonna do more of, and what I'm not gonna do anymore in 2021. Here we go. I'm Stacy Tate. For me, healthy food and sustainability are totally connected. You can grow it yourself. Nature is generous. Okay, my first lesson learned in 2020 had mostly to do with butternut squash harvest and deer. And you'll find in the 2020 lessons learned, there's a lot about deer. <laughs> Now in this bed here, anything that deer like to eat, they're gonna munch through because there's no fence keeping the deer out. And I'll just give you an example. Here's a plant in the cabbage family. And that's what a stalk looks like here in the last week of 2020 in our garden. If it's not a fenced area, the deer are munching through it. But we had an incredible harvest of squash. And in the area that's got the coffee sacks behind me here, we had five butternut squash plants, and then we tossed in as well some pickling cukes and some slicing cucumber plants. And it was just one drip line going down there, very little soil exposed with the five butternut squash plants and the cucumbers. By the time we came to harvest, it was amazing because we filled more than a whole wheelbarrow of squashes from those five butternut squash plants. On average, each plant yielded 10 four pound squash, about two kilos each. So we got 200 pounds, about 100 kilos of butternut squash from five seeds. How ridiculous was that? The deer let them grow, didn't mess with the squash plants, I think partly because there was other yummier things to chew on, and they were able to grow along really well. Now here's the lesson learned that I took out of it. When it was about a month away from ready to harvest, I kept on going through my squash plants and once a week I would take off all the new flowers because those squash plants were just trying to race and reproduce as much as possible. And if you leave the flowers on that will never result in setting good fruit and maturing, then you'll end up with the plant putting a lot of energy into growing squash that you're never going to eat. But by going around weekly for the last month or six weeks of the season and nipping up off all the flowers, the squash that were finishing up ripening and getting ready for harvest got all the love and the energy of the plant. So no worries about the deer in an area that's unfenced for my squash and caring for those flowers at the close of the season was critical to amazing abundance. That was a great lesson learned in 2020. Another lesson learned, which is just a reinforcement of something I seem to always know, I love cabbage. I love growing cabbage. I love making sauerkraut. I love eating coleslaw. I grew up eating cabbage rolls. Everything about cabbage amazes me. So here's a Filderkraut, which is a German variety of cabbage that's specifically grown for making sauerkraut. We're in the last week of 2020, and you can see here that there's a big beauty. Now, normally I find that if I'm able to rotate it off, there we go. Nice big cabbage. Look at the size of that beauty. Head to head, probably bigger than I am. And this plant now, I believe with the root system intact, has potential to actually grow another cabbage plant early in the spring. So I'm not gonna uproot it. And even if I didn't think it had the potential to grow another cabbage plant in the spring, I would use the end of a shovel or a knife to cut off the stalk because you know, rotting roots create really healthy soil. That's why I'm always protecting the soil and letting the roots drive into it. So yeah, we're looking at Christmas dinner and having fresh coleslaw from our own filter kraut cabbage. Yeah, baby. Building on the lessons learned in 2020, I did mention to you how many awesome butternut squash we had. Lesson learned, many people love getting a squash as a thank you gift. And so whenever I would get helped out by a friend or a buddy or someone would help out one of our kids, I'd hand them a butternut squash as a message of I love you and thank you went over really well. Think about giving away things you've grown as gifts. I mentioned to you in that same bed where we grew the butternut squash, we grew a variety of cucumbers. Well, one of those cucumber varieties is a cutting one called a straight eight, which with my messy handwriting you might make out is on this seed bag. So I had incredible success this year with growing straight eights for seed. Yes, cucumbers are really good at not cross pollinating with other species of plants so that you can actually let them go super mature, super overripe and split them open and get the seeds out. And you can see some images there of some straight eights that got massive that I was able to harvest the seeds from. And that really builds into 
seeds because that's a lot of what 2020 learning was about for me. Everything you see here spread out on pieces of cardboard is actually different types of tomatoes that I grew and squished and then noted in this case it's a big red that's determinate as in it's got a limited capacity to grow tall as opposed to an indeterminate which can grow more than three meters, nine, ten feet tall if you let it and have enough uh, support for it to grow. So these are all tomatoes that are here spread out in front of me. But this box is full of all the different seeds that I collected over the season. In this case, it's full of a salad mix. One of my faves, I'll come closer to the camera for you to see it, is these orca dry beans. Check out those beauties. Orca dry beans, yeah. And so what I was able to do was start up basically a little bit of a seed company so that I've got these tiny little envelopes that have 50 or fewer seeds in most cases. This is dry beans. This is some yellow onions. Here's some sunflowers from a giant Russian sunflower, a mammoth sunflower that I grew. And what I discovered is that generally if I was able to put together three or four types of flowers, seeds from a few types of herbs and 15 or 20 vegetables, I could get about 20 or 25 of these little envelopes into one envelope this size and nail it off to people. They basically got their garden, their whole garden for the year, in an envelope. And so with that, they're able to pull together a little bit of inspiration and some easy resources, because how else better to start a great garden in 2021 but to have great seeds. Another part of our quest this year was to get a new car that would match the look of our dog. Doesn't he look right? Soda Pop and the new Nissan Leaf, they match up pretty well. We really wanted to get sustainable transportation actually. We weren't happy any more with burning fossil fuels as our way of transport when we needed a vehicle. So you know last year in my highlights for 2019, I got an electric bike and it's been amazing to cycle to work and do a lot of my errands in the area on an electric bicycle. Now having an electric car and living in a part of the world where our electricity is generated from hydroelectric, it's very clean. It's not fossil fuel burning generated electricity. It actually feels pretty awesome to be able to hop in a car and know there's no emissions connected with driving a car that's whisper silent. It's got lots of power and now that some of our older kids aren't living at home, it makes it easier to put who we have left as a family unit into a little electric car when you need to go out. So, matches the dog and electric. Woohoo! Another thing I learned in 2020 is that my garden was so tasty, deer weren't gonna leave it alone. We first bought this property and moved here about 10 years ago. And when we moved in a decade ago, there would be an occasional deer that would show up now and then in my newly emerging garden beds. And I was like, nah, I don't mind sharing. Well, in the last year, things got a little bit ridiculous. Living where we do, there's a, so many native deer. They're like a small version of mule deer. They have a blackish tail, not a white tail. So they're smaller than deer that are on the mainland of British Columbia, but here on the island, there's just thousands of them. They're everywhere. And I was discovering some evenings, not only would there be a buck sitting underneath my plum tree over here, there'd be three to five deer in the veggie garden munching away. So I started to add on to my fence a topper all the way around the perimeter. This is our main veggie garden. And it's about oh, 65, 70 feet by about 80 feet. So it's five or 6,000 square feet. Just went around the whole perimeter and added a foot or two to the top of the fence. So it was way harder for deer to jump in. And in the process, Wow, we ended up with so many more veggies than we ever have before. And so I did make a little video this year called Keeping Deer Out or Keep Deer Out Four Ways because depending on your budget and your needs, you might have different approaches that you want to employ to keep deer out. So it did become a video and my goodness, the amount of veggies that we were losing to deer we didn't really realize until the fence was in place and then bang, things just blew up in the most beautiful way. About eight months ago, I was sitting right here getting ready to build a raised garden bed and I did a video as I constructed this raised garden bed. 2020 was, if anything, a reminder of how powerful a raised garden bed can be as I think the simplest and most powerful way to produce veg on your property. So this became at first a tomato bed and the tomato harvest this year was the 2020 highlight. I've got a few photos there of the many different varieties of tomatoes and already I've shown you also in this video the seeds that we got from all the different tomatoes we grew and it was so healthy and the soil was so well protected I was able to layer it with a bunch more well aged manure and compost when I harvested the tomatoes and we went right into planting garlic and so now on the property we've got about a 
thousand head of garlic that will be harvested early in summer in 2021. So raised garden beds, I have a video about that on the channel, it's powerful. On top of a great tomato harvest, it was also in another part of the garden, a ridiculous potato harvest. We had so many potatoes. I grew some really dry fibrous white ones that are great for French fries, and I grew some really moist red ones that were beautiful for potato salads, and the harvest was great on both, and I really dialed in curing the potatoes for long-term storage and did a great little video about that that you'll be able to see early in 2021 as well. So tomatoes and potatoes and the victory of raised garden beds was a huge part of 2020. We're looking forward now to the garlic harvest in the next year. I don't know about you, but in my case, I have those gut check moments. 2020 was one of those where I ask myself in a few different ways, Am I doing what I love? Am I doing what's most valuable? Does this really line up with what God put me on the planet for? You're kind of doing a bit of an audit of your life. 2020 was one of those years where you want to go like, am I doing what I really should be up to? 2020 was affirming for me because I was able to put kind of a bow onto one of the biggest life projects I've ever undertaken. It took me a full year and more time connected to a video camera than ever before. And it was an answer to one of my friend's questions, how can I grow a garden? She didn't know where to start. She had very small space. She wanted to grow over 30 different veggies and have it beautiful with flowers and grow herbs. And I was like, I'll just do it, document it on video. And once I was into this big year long project, I realized this is something I could push out to everyone who wants to know. So that rather than taking one of my videos here and one of my videos there, I've got this complete package of how to do everything you need to know with all the questions answered, everything from pest proofing to how to set up drip irrigation to know which veggies love to grow together and which ones don't want to be neighbors. GetBackyardAbundance.com is what it's called. It's really my life's work to this point of everything I've figured out on gardening and everything I've not figured out on gardening because I make mistakes along the way in the video as well and it shows a full year of figuring it out, a hyper compact micro garden that does it all. Get backyardabundance.com, please check it out, share it with someone you love. It could just change their life as they grow more organic veg than they ever imagined in a tiny little space that's only the size of two parking spaces. Get backyardabundance.com, yeah! Around this time last year, I had this notion that I wanted to get more sustainable meat for our family. I wasn't content to just raise animals organically and free range. I wanted to try it a little differently and go wild. So I learned all about salmon river fishing and deer hunting, got myself a crossbow and a whole new group of friends. And wow, have I learned a lot in my pursuit of filling the freezer with sustainably harvested meat from the wild. Deer are plenty and so are salmon where we are. So it made sense here on Vancouver Island to pursue the most sustainable meat that I possibly could. And I gotta say, it was an incredible ride. So on the hunting side of things, I pursued learning how to hunt both with a crossbow and with a rifle. And because there are so many deer around where we live, especially on farmed land, which often the deer are taking much of the farmer's crop away. So I was able to get with my local government a farmland protection permit so that in relationship with farmers who want hunters coming on their land, I could actually go and try for getting a deer on farm land. I was unsuccessful. Man, I spent some time, I learned a lot. One of my friends who I was with was successful, but I wasn't. So that meant going to the big wild yonder and heading out into the forest, into the bush, into areas with a rifle, and there I was successful. So I was able to get my first deer that way. And I know that might be upsetting for some people, so I'm always interested in comments and perspectives as long as it's respectful. What do you think about how sustainable deer meat is as a way to go hunting, making an ethical clean shot when you're legally following all the permits, you're permitted to carry a gun, you're permitted to hunt, you're doing it during the hunting season, and in our case where I live, there's thousands of deer, and these are permitted to be hunted, and you know there'll be more living in that area the following year, because you've harvested deer from that space and created habitat opportunities for other deer. So what are your thoughts on that? I realize that hunting could be divisive. I'm open to ideas and I'm not planning on making the Sustainable Stace channel about sustainably hunted meat. I'm just telling you that's some of what I learned this year. But then further to that, there's the fishing piece. Hopping in a river and fishing for different salmon as they're coming up, depending on the species, depending on the river at different times through the summer and the fall. I was able to fish for different species, coho, spring, and chum. 
They varied, the largest ones that I got that were spring were 94 centimeters long, which is over a meter, over three feet long, bigger than a yard, weighing close to 30 pounds, 15 kilos or so. The smallest ones I would have got would have been maybe in the neighborhood of eight or nine or 10 pounds, so maybe four kilos or so. So exciting, learning lots, wading into a river with hip waders on, losing a lot of fish, losing a lot of gear, but learning so much and being able to get fish that then I could turn so many different ways into a barbecue, a cookout over the fire. I put a bunch in the smoker and smoked the meat, which is a really beautiful, flavorful way to enjoy salmon. And then one of my new favorites, after I would fillet out the salmon, there'd still be the skeleton the bone structure of the fish with a little bit of meat left on it that I didn't want to waste and I got a great idea from a friend. I take that entire skeleton with the meat still on it, put it with a bit of water on a cookie sheet into the oven at a very low temperature for just a few minutes, it would start flaking off the bones. Then with my fingers or a fork, I'd remove all that loose flaked meat, put it in a big mixing bowl, put it together with some spices and some breadcrumbs and make my own salmon patties. I'd form them and shape them, you can see them there put them overnight on parchment paper in the freezer and they'd freeze into nice little salmon patties. And then I just put them in a freezer Ziploc bag and I've got a patty that's partially cooked, beautifully flavorful and about five minutes in the frying pan, I've got my lunch along with the greens that I grow in my garden. It's amazing. So salmon patties from wild caught salmon has been an incredible experience. I gotta say all in all, with deer meat and salmon in the freezer, moving towards more sustainably sourced meat has been a pleasure. So many things to learn, so much opportunity, and hey, if there's those of you out there who hunt with rifle, hunt with crossbow or a bow, you do salmon river fishing or other experiences on sustainably sourcing your meat, let us know on the channel how you do it so that maybe we can share more hopeful, helpful, healthy tips with others who are watching. It could be exciting. Something else I've learned in 2020 is how much talent there is in our family. Our youngest son has started his own YouTube channel and he's showing off his athleticism and his creativity with a trick shot channel. And if you wanna to subscribe to it or there's someone you know who could be very entertained by what our son is up to, the channel is called Bullseye Trick Shots. Three words, Bullseye Trick Shots. Check it out. For me, uh, heading into 2020 was a hotly anticipated year for international travel. I ended up in the end with some a win and a miss. <laughs> so um, I was really looking forward and did get to travel with my wife to go visit small scale tea gardens in the state of Assam in the country of India. So we went to visit Assamese tea producers uh, through much of the state and visit small tea gardens just when harvest was coming on and watch uh, tea being made, black tea, green tea, and a variety of other preparation methods. We got to meet incredible people from all different uh, layers of society in terms of economic placement, very wealthy people and people living in abject poverty. And I got to taste some of the best tea and of course some of the best food you can imagine. It was an epic experience. I did have a few minutes free while I was there and I grabbed out the little camera I was traveling with and I shot a little video, where does tea come from, while I was on location in a few different small tea gardens. So you could check that out on my YouTube channel, that might be of interest to you. My wife and I left to go to India in late February and that's just as things were starting to get brewing around uh, issues around COVID globally. We made it back and I think about a week later there was no planes flying in or out of India for people who live in Canada. So we were so fortunate to have people care for our children, to make it there, visit the tea gardens, see the growers doing well who we source tea from for our business and make it back safely and head into the rest of the year. The miss for me on travel was East Africa. I was so looking forward to going back again and I was scheduled to go visit small scale coffee growers in Rwanda, in DR Congo, in Tanzania and Ethiopia and it was scheduled for May and we just absolutely couldn't do it. So still waiting on the refund for the flights. <laughs> the airline has the money, but man, I was so excited. So I'm hopeful, I'm so hopeful that in 2021, there's an opportunity to go travel to East Africa and visit small scale coffee growers. So that was the win and the miss for travel in 2020. 
I gotta say, like I was hoping, 2020 was an epic year for me. I learned a lot. I'm so glad to share with you a whole bunch of the ups and downs, the things I learned. Deer figured in a lot from munching on my veggies to getting kept out of one of my gardens with deer proofing fencing, building some videos out of that and things like raised garden beds, learning all about sustainable meat and sourcing it well in the wild where I live here. If you've got some comments or some thoughts or what you'd like to see happen on this channel in 2021, I'd love to hear about it. That's all I've got for you today from 2020, things I've learned. Hope it was hopeful, helpful, and healthy for you. And if you guys have been watching this on YouTube, please ring that little notification bell, subscribe to the channel. I look forward to providing you more great resources in 2021. Take care.